All right, thank you guys very much. Um, as I was explaining to Matt, this is probably one of my favorite topics to talk about because it's something that's so undervalued. Um, even back in my day, there was this assumption that you go to school, you get your bachelor's degree. I took some time off, went and got some work experience, came back and got my master's degree and just assumed there was gonna be this thing called a job uh, available when I got out of school. And one of the things that I started to figure out as I started going through the process was that a lot of what we're gonna talk about today are proactive steps you can, you can take to be able to find work that's meaningful to you and profitable to you. It's very, very possible now, it's possible more now today than it ever has been before. So as we're going along, one of the things, this is being recorded, so you guys will have access to the recording, uh, but I do encourage you to take notes, but I also would encourage you to, uh, for us to have this as a dialogue. So as we're going along, if you have questions, um, you know, I'm happy to ask, address questions as we're going through. But I want to start out by seeing how many of you know who this person is. Who is it? Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy. What can you guys tell me about Bill Nye? He doesn't actually have a degree in science. He doesn't actually have a degree in science. What does he have his degree in? Honestly, I can't remember. Honestly, you can't remember? Uh, engineering. Me mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering is what he has his degree in. Now, if you look at him, does he look like a serious scientist or mechanical engineer in this photo? No, why not? How did he get started? Does anybody know how he got started? Started to become a household name when it came to the topic of science? He wrote comedy for an old TV show. He wrote comedy and then he had his own TV show in Seattle, his own little PBS TV show, which I did watch during my undergrad. I'm not, a, not ashamed to admit. But the idea is, what ends up happening when there is a serious conversation about topics such as vaccine, climate change, GMO, who is one of the, one of the international voices for talking about what that topic is about? Bill Nye, why, why is that? We just said he's got a degree in mechanical engineering. People trust him. Why do people trust him? Very good, people trust him. him. What's that? We grew up with him. We grew up with him. So a lot of people I grew up with that I don't try. <laughs> but what, what else? Let's dig deeper on that. Yes? He explains topics that are very complex in a very accessible manner. He explains topics that are very complex in a very accessible manner. And how did he do that? We already answered that. What did he do? He got in front of a camera and he started sharing his personality and he started sharing who he was and he started sharing his knowledge and his enthusiasm and what ended up happening. When there's a serious conversation where there's legislation being talked about on things like climate change, he is one of the few scientists who's invited to come and speak either on national television or international television at the UN or, uh, or for different policymakers. And the reason is, is because he's taken the time and energy to get what we call known. And there's different ways to do it. You don't have to get out there and be a Bill Nye and have everybody know you and be, you know, have 10 gazillion followers on social media. But what you have to think about is, has anybody in here ever participated on an HR, a human resources hiring panel? It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Like hot pokers in the eyes. It's really, really not fun to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. So what we have to be thinking about, whether we're gonna be applying for a, a different school or a job, is we have to put ourselves in the position of the people we're trying to communicate to, which is often human resource people. And we have to think about how do we help them know who we are so that when we apply for a position, they know us. And you may have heard this before. When it comes to getting different opportunities, it's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know, one of the ways you get known, and I'll, I'll throw in a little correction where uh, Matthew said that I work with companies in the United States. I've actually consulted companies on all seven continents, organizations on all seven continents, and I live in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and nobody outside of my little neck of the woods knows who the heck I am. But that doesn't matter because I've gotten known in a circle of people who they're like, hey, we've met this guy, we've interacted with him, we've conversed with him, 
he's a good place, a good resource to go to talk to. So whether I've consulted Starbucks or the NFL or I worked with the US Air Force or whatever the program is, one of the things that I have to be cognizant of is the HR people would much rather find somebody they know rather than have to go through an extensive job search where you have to look at a ton of resumes, you have to go through all. So the more we can help the right organizations know who we are, the more opportunities we create for ourselves to get interviews and with those interviews have an opportunity to actually get hired in positions that are meaningful to us. So as we look at this, really for me, this comes out of a, a, out of a deep passion. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but about 75, depending on the study, about 75 to 80% of Americans say they dislike or hate their jobs. Stop and think about that. I'm sure nobody knows anybody in graduate school who gets tired or hates graduate school at some point or PH, their PhD program, being facetious, of course. And I, I stopped and thought about that because I, I was at a military academy, left the military academy, had no idea what I wanted to do. And I went through this period too where I'm like, who the hell am I and what do I want to do? I have no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, when I left the military academy, my, my, uh, I was scheduled to be a, a, an aviator. And I don't know if you know this, but there aren't many military posi uh, civilian positions for military aviators. So my backup plan, I didn't have one. And so I had to think about, you know, what do I want? And then I started looking at all of these people I know who are miser miserable in the work they do. And I get it. I had to pay back student loans. You got to do what you got to do for a while. But if the majority of people hate their, hate their jobs, I mean, that's a pretty sad way to live, especially when we come into something with graduate school, we're passionate and we're excited about it, right? take the time and energy to study it. We want to be able to you know, do something with what this field is about and then end up having a life that isn't very fulfilling. I'm, I'm on a mission to, 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 to change that. So I'll, I'll show you some examples of graduate students and uh, students that I've worked with in law school as well. So the first one that I want to share is a quick st case study. This was Erin Podolak. Now Erin was a, uh, she was working on her master's degree in uh, science communication and journalism. She would graduated from Lehigh University, came to the University of Wisconsin, uh, was in her last semester of graduate school, and she was not in our program. And she walks into my classroom and she says, Don, just want to let you know, I think this class is a bunch of BS. I don't think it's going to serve any value for me as a science writer. This is for marketers and people who have, want to do stuff like that. It doesn't have anything to do with people who are in hard sciences or, or communicating about hard sciences. I said, Aaron, it's great to meet you. Right? That, that, was, that was literally her introduction. And I appreciated it because she was being honest. She had this mindset that, no, this is for people in the business school or who are marketing. And branding is about putting these false narratives about who we, you know, it's like being on Instagram. You know nobody's life is like what they put up on Instagram. You know, you, you see this tiny little sliver. And she, she was being honest. And I said, Aaron, love your approach, love your honesty. Would you be willing to just do what I'm going to recommend, which are things I'm going to tell you guys as a part of this presentation? Would you be willing to do the work that I'm going to tell you to do and just see what happens? <sighs> OK, Dan, I'll do it. So she starts doing it. And I say, Aaron, what is it that you'd really like to do? Well, I'm about to graduate. I have no job prospects. Uh, you know, finishing my master's degree, I thought I'd go to a Lehigh and then I'd come to UW-Madison, I'd have these great opportunities and I have nothing. I, I'd like to get a job. And I said, no, 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 because I could go and get you a job at McDonald's right now. What do you want to do? She said, well, as a science writer, I would love to write for a big science organization. I said, well, who is that? And she said, well, if I could have my pick of what would happen, I would get recognized by Scientific American. Does anybody in here know Scientific American? OK, so she's now going big, right? She's, she's going really big. So I said, OK, cool. We laid out a plan of exactly what to do, things that you're going to learn. You start to identify and find people on social media who work with or are connected with or affiliated with Scientific American. And you start doing research. LinkedIn and Twitter are invaluable, although in the sciences right now, one of the most popular platforms that's growing big time is Instagram. Believe it or not, Instagram is growing tremendously. So she started following and tracking these people and started doing some of the things that we talked about. And three weeks into the course, she pulls me over to her computer and she goes, Don, look, 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 this is so cool. Somebody from Scientific American liked something that I put up. And she was like over the moon. Next week, I kid you not, literally the next week, she calls me over to her computer. Don, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. Somebody from uh, Scientific American retweeted me. 
How cool is that? And at the time, all she was doing to start to build her profile and what we talked about was, and you can do this on LinkedIn, was start sharing what you know. And so she put together this blog and this blog started sharing uh, tips and information about breaking down science topics. And so at first, of course, she was a little bit nervous about publishing. She did go through and, and start publishing, but she started sharing what she knew. And two weeks later, Don, come here, you gotta see something, you gotta see something. I'm like, this is incredible. So first, you start getting some interaction with people from Scientific American. Next, you get retweeted. Next, you're getting followed by. And she goes, check out this article. So this article appeared on Scientific American's website. Top young and up and coming science writers in the world to pay attention to. Guess who's featured? Aaron Podolak. Six weeks into the class. Guess how many job offers she came up? She got three job offers almost immediately. Scientific American said, Aaron, we really love what you're doing. Would you be interested in traveling to Europe with us? We've got a panel over in Europe that we're going to be doing, and we'd like you to talk about how scientists can better understand and leverage communications. And we've got a couple in the US that we're going to be doing. Would you be willing to do that? What do you think she said? Of course, right? So the idea is that as we start to share what we know, and as we start to think about thinking about building your profile online, is about having a job interview starting now where you can start sharing information that you know people would want to know about you, about what your communication style is like, what your passion is about, what, what it is that you're really into. And it's a little bit scary at first for most people. How many people here have a blog or an active LinkedIn account or a place they're publishing? Okay, how many do not? How many does it kind of freak them out to think about doing that? And be honest, it's okay. It still makes me, okay. So the idea is you have to think about, this isn't about you being self-promotional. What this is about is about you sharing and demonstrating your knowledge with people. And again, if you stop and you think about it from an HR person standpoint, if I get a several qualified people send me resumes and job applications, what is the first thing or one of the first things most HR professionals will do once they get that, the, the names of qualified people? Go to the source of all light, truth, and knowledge, the Google, and they will Google them. Now imagine, what is your name? Amy. Imagine Amy and I are competing for the same position. And your name is? Dan. Dan is the HR person. And Dan goes and does a Google search for Amy and he finds a blog or a very active LinkedIn page that talks about what Amy has learned, what she's excited about, curating uh, valuable content that's related to the industry, and also has her resume. And then Dan goes and looks at my page, and mine has just my resume. Silly question, who's gonna stand out more? Who is it? Amy, why? Very good. She has a larger presence, which makes it seem like she's probably more interested and dedicated to her field. What she's done is she's made Dan's job easier because she's sharing information that would probably be asked in a job interview anyway. What are you passionate about? What do you study? Why do you study it? What do you believe about this? All the types of things that you're asked in more of the personal part of the interview, like if you get to go to dinner with people and that type of thing. So she's getting extra interview time that I am not getting. That is how she starts to get known. Remember, it's not wh who you know, it, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and you start to stand out. The other thing to point out that I didn't, what is your name? That, uh, Vicky. Vicky. Vicky had a great answer. There was a study done at Yale University looking at HR professionals and what was the number one trait they looked for when they were hiring somebody? What was the number one trait that made somebody a good long-term fit for, their co for a company? Do you know what that number one trait was? Take some guesses. Passion. Passion, exactly right. Most people will say degree or grade point average or something like that, but it was enthusiasm for the topic and enthusiasm for the organization where they were applying. Why? Does anybody know why that is? Reason is this, as a business owner, I can, I can tell you this from a business owner standpoint, the average length of stay of somebody in their 20s at a job, does anybody know what it is? 
Two years, very good guess. 13 months, 13 months. Now as a business owner, let's say I hire you and your name is? Allison. Allison, I hire Allison. For the first three to four months, what is Allison gonna be doing when she works for me? Learning. Learning. So she is, no offense, she's a liability to me. She is not bringing in money, she's costing me money to train her, right? So I have a window of 13 months when you get into your 30s, it's, it's uh, up to 36 months is the average length of stay, but we're gonna stick with the 20s. So for the first three to four months of a 13 month career with me, she's costing me money. Finally, I get her up to speed and she's you know, revenue generating, revenue positive. What is she doing during the last two to three months of her time with me? What's that? Looking for other jobs, right? So stop and think about it. If I have somebody who's there just for a job, I'm only gonna get about eight months of quality work out of them after going through the painful process of reviewing resumes, doing interviews, it's not worth it. So one of the things you guys can do that is a huge advantage, just like Erin did, is she started connecting with people at Scientific American, and then she started sending direct messages about what Scientific American had meant for her and what it had done for her professionally and why she loved it so much. And when you give somebody a genuine compliment, what does that do? Makes them feel good, right? And so you start finding companies and organizations. She's now a science writer at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is what she wanted to ultimately end up doing. And has been there, I don't know how many years now. But the idea is you start to reach out to people and you start to say, this is why I wanna work at your company or with your organization. That demonstrates you've taken the time and energy to make sure they're a good fit. It's very much like dating. And people will laugh at me when I say that, but how many hours are in a week? Room full of graduate students, it should be fast. How many hours in a week? 168 hours, right? Average person sleeps how many hours a day? We're not average, because we're graduate students, right? <laughs> so we'll say the, again, the average is eight hours a day. So we have 168 minus 56, because 56 hours is seven times eight, right? That leaves us with 112 waking hours. How many hours do, does the average person devote to their professional work? their job? 40. 40. Actually physically being at the job, right? But think about all of the things you have to do to prepare to go to work, commute to go to work, the email, the other stuff you get at home, it's probably closer to 50 to 60. That starts to suspiciously look like half of your life. And if you're working for a company or an organization or doing stuff where you really don't like anybody, that starts to get really miserable really fast. So when I say it's important for you guys to do your due diligence, I've turned down at tremendous opportunities, which has been really hard to do because when I saw how many numbers were before the decimal point, it was like, oh. But I'm like, you know what? I know this organization isn't a good fit. And we've all done that where we've befriended or dated somebody that we knew wasn't a good fit and it ended up costing us in the end. So, so the idea is, again, you take the time to do the due diligence. This is another one of my students that I'll quick profile. This is somebody who is in law school now. She, she, helped, uh, she used her social profile to get into law school, but she's continued to build her personal brand using a blog and using social media, primarily social media, to let people know what she's learning about, what she's passionate about as far as law topics. And she sent me this message re just at the start of this semester, and she said, um, Having a solid understanding of how to market and strategically communicate has been a major selling point. I've been interviewing small law firms. It's open opportunities that typically aren't available to uh, first year law students. So she's getting experiences because she's understanding how to communicate, not just with the law firms, but now those law firms are saying, we need to better understand how we communicate. So as you build skills with these social tools, you can get better at being able to advance your field. Is there anybody in here who thinks the world is super saturated with clear knowledge and everybody follows that clear knowledge on things like climate change? Right, we know what the answer is, right? And, and the reason that there's issues in our country, very few countries have this debate about climate change and other things, is because we've done a horrible job. We've just assumed that information is enough. That's one of the big challenges with academia. We assume that you create the information, people will know it and understand it. 
If that were true, there would be no climate change, there'd be no poverty, there'd be no, you know, lots of problems. The goal is, in this case, is she started to see that she could leverage what she used to build her personal brand to be able to create opportunities. And then she was put on this uh, committee for, she's from uh, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, which is where Making a Murderer took place. And so she was put on a panel to try to help figure out how do we not be, people think of that when they think of Manitowoc County, which is a big challenge. But she is working with C, a, a couple of CEOs and executive directors, and she's a 22 year old. Is that gonna create opportunities for her down the road? Absolutely, how did she get that opportunity? By creating her personal profile and getting known by the right people online. And the last example here is one of my favorite uh, examples, Kevin Stonewall. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Kevin Stonewall. Kevin is one of a tremendous, tremendous young man. He's now in medical school at Loyola uh, Medical School in Chicago. He started using social media because at 19, he discovered a breakthrough in colon cancer research. And so he started getting internationally known for the research he was doing and he took my class and he's like, Don, I don't wanna be known just as a doctor. I wanna change people's lives beyond the scope of just medicine. And so if you look at him and what he's doing, so he's got 28,000 followers, not a huge, not small, but not huge, but he's got medical student, motivational speaker and marketing consultant. So he is, while he's in med medical school, he's prepping opportunities to be able to do things other than just be a doctor because he knows he needs to scale beyond that. So he's been on BET, he's been on national news with his breakthrough, international news with his breakthroughs. And so he's being, he's actually in the process of being thoughtful about what he shares and what he does. So this is kind of in the process. So one of the keys for you guys to think about is you have to think about what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. So what they all have in common is that they took the time and energy to think about what they wanted, which is really, really important. And then what they did is they actually executed on it. They took a deep breath and hit publish and started sharing. So again, we can talk about specific ideas and specific challenges. In my class, if you take my digital marketing, personal branding class, one of the things you have to do is you have to pick, up, pick a topic we go through a process of identifying that topic, then you have to pick the core audience that you wanna reach, and then over the course of the semester, you have to develop a blog and social media plan that you actually execute and make actual connections like Aaron did as a part of your grade. So this is a formulaic process that no matter who you are, it works if you're willing to work it. Just like Aaron said when she came in, I don't, I don't think this is gonna work, now she's one of the big champions of it. She'll tell people, take that class because what it'll do is it'll help you think about what you ultimately want. And so that's one of the big things is thinking about why do you even want to do this? What, what, is, what is the answer? And for each of you, it can be unique. It doesn't need to be a set answer, but why do you want to build the personal brand in terms of thinking about creating professional opportunities? You're all here in part because the title is about standing out in a crowded job market. So then who do you want to stand out to? And what do you want them to know about you? And that's what you start to do. And I'll share some formulas of how do you create active profiles that are professional? What are the, what are the, what are the tips? What are the tricks? What are the techniques? Because it can be really overwhelming when you start to think about, oh my gosh, I have to do this too on top of everything else. I know everybody in here has way too much time on their hands, right? Nobody's information overloaded, right? You know, the stress level I've seen in grad students in my 20 years of teaching has dramatically increased over the years and the pressure has dramatically increased. So I'm gonna give you these formulas again that are proven. They work time and time again if you put in the time and energy to work them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you kind of these tips, tricks, and advice from working with thousands and thousands of people. And here is the simple roadmap. Now I wanna qualify because one of the things that I like to do is I like to be an interpreter I liked, one of the things that drove me nuts about graduate school, it was actually why I, what I, why I went back to, to graduate school in communications and marketing, is that we make things so complex a lot of times that people can't understand why they should care about what it is that we think they should care about. Again, Bill Nye the science guy is a great example. What did he do? He didn't dummy things down. He made them accessible to kids. And when he did that, he was able to help people understand very basic core information, which then 
other people started saying, hey, he's really good. Maybe we'll have him come on our local TV show, or maybe we'll have him come to this conference talking about this topic or that topic. So the, I, I really love to look for patterns and what are the threads of simplicity that we can all apply. So sometimes I'll have students say, well, this isn't complex enough. And I'm like, yeah, well, how is the process you're using now going? Okay, again, like with Aaron, you gotta, you gotta play with it. So it's really, really simple. The first is you have to define yourself. So what do you bring to the table? So sometimes you'll see people will do these um, Myers-Briggs type tests. I actually have my students do one. It's, a, it's not super science-based, but it's helpful. It's called 16 personalities, 16personalities.com. And what that does is that gives you a pr it's pretty accurate profile of who you are. For me, as an example, I'm horrible working alone and I'm not super attentive to detail. I love working in groups, I love generating ideas, I love starting things, and I love turning it over to people who are idea generators. So it was kind of humorous when I first took my, okay, I can't be a fighter pilot, now what am I gonna be with the rest of my life? I took one of those career uh, guides in terms of what to do, and they said, Don, you'd make a perfect accountant. Because they were looking at my acumen when it came to math, they weren't looking at my personality. I would be horrible. Nobody would want me to do their books in here, trust me. You would not want that. So the idea is you have to get comfortable with who you are and, so, and figuring out who you are and what it is that you bring to the table and what it is that you want. Because again, just like dating, when you think of all the time you're gonna spend at a job, you have to think of it as, as a relationship. And it's okay to go into, I tell my students this all the time, when you go into any job interview, it's your job to interview that company as much as, as it is for them to interview you. I learned that the hard way by accepting a position that ended up being absolutely horribly miserable for me, even though everybody on the outside was like, wow, you've made it, this is so cool. And I'm like, no, you're not on the inside. It's like, you know, again, one of those relationships where it's like, oh, that person's so nice. And no, they're not that nice. So the idea is you have to figure out what you want and define what you bring to the table so you're ready to share what your strengths are when you, when you talk. And then develop what those goals are. What do you want to do? You know, if I want to get to Scientific American as an example, I might not be able to go there right away. So maybe I make connections at Scientific American. And then I do some informational interviews with people there and I say, how do I get to this point? What are the things that I can do? Are, is there any way that you could recommend a mentor or a process that I can follow? So you have to be willing to put in the work. Next is you have to define who your niche is. So I've literally had one of my favorite examples is a gentleman who literally had one company that he wanted to work for and he created a website that was all, it, it, it's a company called HubSpot and he created a website that was called Hire Me HubSpot. And all it was about was about why he was a good fit for HubSpot. He created a 15 minute webinar that people at HubSpot could watch as to why he was a good fit. And then he got Facebook ads and he made Facebook ads that targeted anybody who was a manager or above at Facebook, or excuse me, at HubSpot. So that when they went on Facebook, they would see his ad. The average is about five, it's 437 people apply for every, 437 qualified people apply for every job at HubSpot. So, you know, the chances aren't horrible, but they aren't that great. Guess what ended up happening? HubSpot ended up hiring them because he demonstrated why, he knew everything about the company. He could tell them everything about all the different people and their philosophy, and they knew that they had, he had done his vetting and he would be a good fit. He ended up staying there for about seven years, broke off on his own. We were just chatting about it and he was laughing because he's like, man, it seems like a lifetime ago. But that's how specific you can get. You don't have to get that specific, of course, but the idea is you can. I mean, if you really find a place or an organization that you feel like you would be a good fit, there's no reason for, to not do that. But like when people come to me and say, well, I'm interested in getting a job in um, science. Like, do you want to go clean science labs? Do you want to be doing research? You know, there's a wide range of what those jobs are, right? We have to be more specific and we have to think more about, you think about things too, like where do you want to live? You know, what, what the personality or the, or the philosophy of the organization is like. So for me, with my niche, for my audiences, I work with students or individuals who are looking to make career transitions. But then when it comes to business, I work with businesses that are looking to do some level of social good. If I don't feel like they're doing that with my definition of that, 
then I don't work with them. That's my niche. And sometimes I get made fun of by companies who will say, social good, dude, this is about making money. We don't want to work with you. And I'm like, exactly, we're not good fits for each other. That's fine. So again, sometimes when you, when you do that niching, you get you know, some people who would be good fits, but you also find out people who wouldn't, and that's okay to disqualify people. And then you have to create high value content. And I'll show you what I mean by create, because it doesn't mean you have to create all kinds of original stuff. So it's really, really simple. You figure out who you are and what you want to do and be really brutally honest about it. Next, you start thinking about who it is that you want to connect with. So how many people here have some clear ideas of businesses or organizations they would like to work with after they graduate? OK, excellent. For those of you who don't, which is very normal, that's where you start doing your research. You start looking at and start thinking about. And it's, it just takes time. Again, it's like dating. You have to spend time looking at these companies, doing some research. And there's no fast and easy way to do it. Um, and then last, like I said, we'll talk about the real nuts and bolts. Once you do that, now you can go and you can create. So let's look at that first step. So the first step is this. And these are three areas and three questions that you can start to answer on your own. So this is the three-legged stool principle that I learned from a gentleman who's a, a career coach named Dan Miller. And obviously, if you take a leg away from the three-legged stool, what happens? It doesn't stand. So you need all three of these in order to build a solid platform. The first is you have to look out and list out what vocational skills you have. So what do you bring to the table just from kind of a basic skills standpoint? And list those things out. If you are like me and you're from the Midwest, you're horrible about talking about yourself. So ask other people. You know, talk to your advisors, talk to friends, talk to places you've worked, and ask them, what are some things that you bring to the table? Now again, remember, one of my vocational skills is being really good at math and numbers. Right? But, 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 the next thing you have to look at is what's of value to you. What do you care about? For me, sitting and crunching numbers, even though I could be really, 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 really good at it, would drive me insane. It would be soul crushing. So just because you're good at something doesn't mean you know, that's how you find your fit. So you have to think about what do you care about? What's valuable to you? And this is a big thing with millennials when it comes to millennial messaging and Gen Z messaging is people are looking for work that matters to them and where they fit. And companies are starting to know that. So you see a lot of companies doing more and more social good initiatives, which I love to see. So that's where, again, you can think about what's important to you. Look at what the organizations do outside. But also think about you know, opportunities that you know, what you would like in what do you value. Again, for me, one of the challenges with academia is the teamwork component. Because I don't know if you've ever worked with any professors, but there sometimes isn't a ton of collaboration. And, you're kind of, and that's hard. So I've had to figure out ways to build collaborative opportunities. Um, so you know, when you have different values, sometimes your work might not give them completely. And sometimes you need to manufacture them. But you need to think about what it is that's of value to you. And then last but not least, because a lot of my students end up finding now more than ever is the best opportunity to be entrepreneurial and create the side hustle. And when I say side hustle, I say hustle lightly because I don't believe in working 4,000 hours a week just to make money. It's not. But the opportunity to create side things is side, side work, uh, side, explore opportunities where you might not have gotten a degree in is absolutely incredible. But you have to think about what is it that people are going to pay you for. So you might be really, really passionate about something, but if you're not good enough to do it, like let's say, for example, uh, I love to do CrossFit. I, I participate in CrossFit competitions. But anybody ever been to the CrossFit games here in Madison? It's pretty incredible. I'm never going to be at that level. So it's a hobby for me. You know? So I have to realize that, nope, never going to age group, never going to be able to qualify. So economic model would say, do this as a hobby because you're not going to be able to get paid for it. So sometimes there's things you might really, really like to do. And Maybe it isn't something you can get paid for professionally, but you can do it as a hobby on the side. So those are the three things you have to think about, is what do you bring to the table? What do you care about? And what do you value? And then who's willing and who's looking to hire and pay for that product, service, whatever it might be. In this case, it's a service, your, your skills and talents. Does it make sense? OK. So next, what we want to do is we want to keep this in mind. And this is where I like to call this the Oprah effect. So 
one of the things in human psychology is that when we get a chance to read about or see somebody um, before they meet us, we feel like we're at an advantage. So one of, the, one of the examples that I like to talk about is like if you ever look at CarMax or Carvana or anything, you know, why, why, True Car, why have those sites become so popular? How many people like used car shopping and going to you car? <laughs> Nobody, right? Because you're afraid, you don't know the person there, you're afraid that they're gonna sell you something. So what these sites have done is they've kind of gotten rid of the salesperson in the sense of you're able to get knowledgeable and know a lot before you go to the car dealer so you can be knowledgeable and not get the wool pull over your eyes. So you get to kind of meet the, 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 what the sales process actually is, what things are actually gonna cost. So I like to call this the Oprah effect for this reason. How many of you, if Oprah Winfrey walked in the room right now, would think that most, uh, most people would walk up and say, hello, Miss Winfrey, it's a pleasure to meet you. Versus, Oprah, what's up, how you doing? Giving her a big hug. How many people would think the second is the more popular way people would greet her? Show of hands. Most people think it's the first? Really, you guys, that, doesn't, <laughs> that, that would not fit the category of, of her fans. Her fans feel like they would run up to her and give her a big hug, like, Oprah, oh my God. And I would say, well, why would you do that? So for those of you who raise your hand, why would you feel it would be appropriate to run up to this woman and give, which is what I would do, I'm a huge Oprah fan. I have no, no, shame, no shame at all admitting that. But why, why, would I, why would I do that? Oprah has never met me. She has no idea who I am. So what makes me break down the social barriers to feel like I can approach a stranger like that and do that? She has a talent for making us feel like we know her. She has a talent for making us feel like we know her. And how does she do that? She makes herself vulnerable. Yep. So we watch her and we can see her. So we're meeting her before she, we actually meet her. Now this sounds kind of weird, but again, it's a huge advantage for a human resource person to go and do a Google search and meet you and learn about you before they actually bring you in for an interview. It saves them time. It makes it much more efficient for them to do an interview. And when you come into the interview, I will guarantee you, you will stand out and the, the dynamic of the interview will be different. They'll treat you like they know you to some degree. It's much less awkward. It's much less, not, not unprofessional, but it's much more relaxed when you take the time and energy to, to, to do this. So that is a huge, when you think again, the psychology of human interaction, one of the, again, the number one thing people look for is enthusiasm. Another thing hiring people look for is chemistry. Will this person be a good fit? So if any of you have done job interviews, you might have had second job interviews where it's like, I want you to go to lunch or dinner with a couple of key people and you know, go hang out. Well, why are they doing that? Because they want to give you a free lunch? No. They want to see, do you fit with the personality of the people there? Is there a good chemistry fit? And again, this is where that content can come in. So as we look at who we're trying to connect with, this is what I have students do. And you guys can follow the same process in uh, um, and follow the, same, the exact same process. So start doing research and start listing out. So what I do with my students is I have them develop a list of 20 to 50 uh, individuals and organizations. I have them list out, we usually start with Twitter because Twitter is public. It's very, very easy to interact with people, very easy to have uh, initial conversations. It's like going to a giant networking event and people feel very comfortable, just quick meet and greeting. And so what we do is we go to search.twitter.com and then we just type in the topics that we're interested in, the fields that we're interested in, the businesses or organizations that we're interested in, and we see what pops up. And we copy down their Twitter handle and then we look at their bios and we look to see is this a person who it might be beneficial for me to connect with. We do the same thing on LinkedIn. So if you wanna use a simple Excel spreadsheet, that's all we do, really, really simple. But the idea is you start getting thoughtful about the process. So again, let's imagine that you're applying for a job and I'm also applying for said job. And as we're applying for the job, it's very clear all I'm looking for is a job and you're looking to work at that company for a very particular reason, who's gonna stand out? the person who 
very clearly wants to work for that company. So it sounds super, super simple, but people overcomplicate and don't do this. They don't take the time. So 20, 30 years ago, I couldn't go on a thing like LinkedIn to find out who employees were at Starbucks headquarters or at REI or whatever business you wanna pick. Now, all I have to do is spend a couple of hours, if even that, going and doing searches and finding out. You do the same thing on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a great section uh, called LinkedIn University, where it's all for university students. They have both undergrad and grad content, if I recall correctly, and it'll walk you through how do you do a search to put together a list of people to reach out to, and then how do you do it in a non-creepy way, in a way that you know is appropriate, like, like again, going to a specific networking event. And then as you research those people, you might find out, as I, as I said earlier, that what you thought might have been a good fit doesn't turn out to be a good fit. And so you can change who it is you're looking for, but you have to be proactive. I guarantee you, as much as this is gonna hurt every one of you in the room right now, nobody is sitting there and saying, I can't wait for Amy or Dan or somebody or Vicky to, to, to apply to my company. They're not sitting there waiting specifically for you. They're looking to fill a need for their organization. So the more we can show them that we can fit that need, the more impact we can have in terms of helping us get hired. So this is where we get into the content production part. So this is more of the nuts and bolts. So why are we creating content? We're not creating content because we wanna show off how smart we are. We're not doing it to say, hey, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. What we're doing is we're demonstrating our passion and our knowledge for our topic, what it is that we care about. And I'll, I'll be happy as we do the Q&A to share some examples of things that, uh, you know, off the top of my head that I would recommend that you guys do. So why should you share online? The main reason to share online is that whole concept of when you share online, it allows people to see that you're active. And again, if you take the example I gave very early on of one person versus another person applying for the same job and one person has been very active on social and one person has not, when that person does the Google search, the HR person does the Google search, who's gonna show up? The, the, the first person who's taken the time and done the, done the work to put in and build that profile online. It's, it's really, if you think about it, it's the modern day resume, except it's an online, living, growing, breathing thing. So the way to think about this and why it's so important to produce is this is called the 99-1 rule of the internet. I don't know if any of you guys have heard this before. The 99-1 rule of the internet states that 90% of people who go online, including social, do nothing but look. They just look and observe, they lurk. 9% of people will go and they will interact. They will like, they will share, they might comment, but that's about the extent they're going to get to. Only 1% of people have the courage or the understanding to actually create and build a profile. So how do you stand out? Well, if you wanna get in the 1% really, really, really fast, what you start doing is you start to say, okay, I'm gonna actually be proactive and start creating stuff. Why that is, there's a lot of reasons why it is, but this is, this is something that as you look at it and you say, okay, I wanna stand out, the simplest thing you can do is to start to become active. And we'll talk through again, what are some of those specific things you can do to start to be active. So what should you share online? So how do I, get, how do I start getting to be active? What does that mean? Um, I'm not savvy with Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever. What the heck does that mean? Because I'm intimidated by creating my own, I don't know what to do, is the number one tip comes from one of my friends, his name is Chris Brogan, and he's become a friend over time. Chris is a uh, world-renowned author in the digital marketing space, uh, written a number of New York Times best-selling books, a $25,000 an hour keynote speaker, goes and is on national news a lot of times when it comes to digital marketing. And when I, was, when I first started learning about social media, because I am not a tech person by design, I could, and I tell people this all the time, I could li go live in the back country with no tech at all and, of Alaska and I would be happy. But the problem is I believe that we have knowledge we have to share to make the world a better place. It might sound a little Pollyanna to people, but if there are problems and we have information that we can help alleviate those problems, it's our obligation to learn the tools technologies and techniques 
to stop the fake information that's out there, to start to combat the negativity. So that's, what I, that's why I do what I do. And I said, Chris, I targeted him because he's one of the, if you, if you get to know him online, just one of the most genuine, open people out there. And I'm like, I really like this guy. He's not smoking mirrors with a bunch of fancy cars behind him, you know, and Facebook ads saying, yeah, buy my product and you'll have all these cars and you'll have, you know, those, those types of people. And finally, I got to connect with him and I said, Chris, can you tell me the most important thing I can teach my students, I can talk about at the keynotes and workshops I give around the country, what is the number one key to being successful? And I'm expecting this, you know, beautiful long diatribe about what to do and how to do it, and he tweets back to me two words. That was it. There's a Maya Angelou quote that's often attributed to her is that people won't remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And when you go out of your way to help somebody out, I've, I've walked into situations where I was by far the least qualified candidate. And I've walked in and I said, I bet you, you guys are really overwhelmed with this hiring process and you've got this going on, 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 this going on. And here's how I can help you by taking some of that burden off. And you can see the hiring people just totally change. Like, this guy gets us. He's not here. He's, he's here to make things easier for us, not just to fill a job. So when you start thinking about what can I do to be helpful, what can you do to be helpful for an HR person, start posting stuff so they can start reading about you and learning about your competencies, learning about your passions, so the job interview process is easier. Qualifying you as a candidate for a job is easier. I mean, that is so undervalued when it comes to thinking. Again, I've done this with graduate programs where people are applying to graduate schools. I've done this with all different types of positions. And the way to be helpful, again, is to say, I'm going to help you get to know me and see if I'm a good fit for you. And I'm going to demonstrate what I know. Because in a job interview, you're going to probably ask me, what are, what are some things that I listen to? Or what, what are important classes I've taken? What are ways I keep learning outside of school? So this is what I recommend you do. <clears throat> So either Twitter or, and or LinkedIn, if you were in my class, you'd have to be active on both. And you can create a free blog on a place like Wix, or you can create a, a WordPress or something like that. I want to qualify when I'm saying these things, too, is there's different types of content you can create. I am unabashedly a horrible writer. I have learned to quit judging myself because I would always try to measure myself by my colleagues and my, and I, writing is just not something I do naturally. So as we're talking about this, if you start to look at my content, I go heavy on video. Video is a lot easier to produce. It's by far the most in-demand content on all of the major social networks if you look at their algorithms. Also, I will qualify by saying, how many people in here love the sound of their voice and love seeing themselves on camera? Nobody, right? Okay, I'm the same way. But what I realize is if people can hear my voice and see me, what are they doing? They're meeting me before they meet me. So that when I walk into an interview and they see me, they already know me. That is a huge advantage. So I'm not online doing videos for my own sake. I've been told many times that I have a face made for radio, and that's okay, which I do. But that's, you know, so again, you realize that it's not about anything other than you uh, putting content. So you can, what I'm saying, content, you can do audio, uh, voice, slash podcast, text, or you can do uh, video. So what I do is this, is 70 to 80% of the time, what I do is I curate and identify people's stuff that I think is really salient and relevant to my field. I put the light on them and I make a recommendation. I say, hey, if none of you are familiar with social media and how to do it right, check out Chris Brogan. And I'll start retweeting and sharing his stuff. And I might say, hey, at Dan, here's an article from Chris Brogan that you might like. And I start sharing out their stuff. What that does is that demonstrates to people that I, one, am being helpful. And remember, it's how you make people feel. Two, what it does is it takes the pressure off me to feel like I need to be an expert. What I'm doing is I'm saying, it's like sitting down with a friend and a friend says to me, if you could only read one or two things on LinkedIn, what would you read? I share those out. 
but now I'm doing it publicly. So what ends up happening is people who follow my profile can also benefit, instead of me talking one-on-one -on -one to somebody like Matthew, now everybody can see what I'm recommending. What also happens is that the person who I'm making the recommendation and saying check out their stuff, I get on their radar. And they start saying, hey, that's cool, who's this Don guy? I'm not sure who he is, but you know, he's doing kind of some nice stuff, huh? So for example, and this is kind of a goofy, goofy example, but Chris Brogan, who I mentioned, has about 350,000 followers on Twitter. So three, 350,000, and he follows less than 400 people. I'm one of those 400 people. Why is that? Because I've promoted his stuff because I really believe in it so much. So a lot of the times I'm promoting his stuff so much that he's like, I want to get to know this Don guy and by extension, I've been able to make a lot of great industry contacts because people said, oh, you're connected with Chris? That's like an Amazon five-star review, so you must be worth following for some reason. So you, as, you, as you think about it, again, think about organizations, businesses, individuals who work at business and start sharing out what you find that's useful and valuable. Um, like yesterday, I had a, a, a guy who's a top 50 worldwide blogger guest lecture in my class. And I mentioned, he mentioned a couple of things in class and some of my students had cars get stuck in the snow. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but. Um, and so what I did is I tweeted out some of what this gentleman had said to them saying, hey, I know you were asking about SEM rush and keyword optimization and Mike mentioned this one tool that you might wanna check out that's free. People who are following my channel see, one, I'm curating from good thought leaders Two, I'm being helpful. And that three, that what I'm willing to do with my channels, I'm willing to use that channel to help other people get smarter and better at what they did. I'm not saying I'm the one who knows this, I'm putting the spotlight on other people. So I curate. So again, find the stuff that you think would be of value. Then 10 to 20% of the time, what you do is you actually create stuff. So give your thoughts and perspectives on what you believe is important. So all of you in here as graduate students are in an upper echelon and you don't realize that because you're around other graduate students on a top academic campus. But you, if you go out in the mainstream population, what you have studied, you guys have expertise in your area far beyond what I have, far beyond what the majority of people are ever gonna have. So start sharing out some of your experiences and what you've learned. So like for example, with one of my students, I said, why don't you just share out the top three things you learned in each of the favorite courses that, that you've taken and say how it applies to your particular field. So here are my three favorite courses I took and here's what I learned in those that apply to everyday life in my industry. Because the problem is when I look at your resume and if you have on LSC 432 as on your resume as something you've taken, I have no idea what that means. Now I teach in the Department of Life Sciences Communication. Who can tell me what life sciences communication is? I can't tell you what it is, but you know, the, the challenge is that our job when we start creating content, if we can explain what we've learned from different courses, different experiences we've had, different internships, that allows us to demonstrate our ability to take knowledge like a Bill Nye apply it tactically and then teach people who don't have the opportunity to, to take the same class as we did or do or go to the same type of institution as the UW-Madison, I can give them some experience and some knowledge and help as well. So I'm not saying I'm the world's smartest guy because that's the, that's the blowback I get from my undergrads, graduate, and PhD students every single semester. I, who am I to say this stuff? I don't have enough knowledge. And everybody, everybody I know has that gremlin in their, boy, in their head, by the way. Every one of us has that. You can't put pub, pub, hit publish. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. Who are you? You haven't taken enough classes. And then the response to that gremlin is, I'm not trying to be the world's greatest expert. I'm just trying to help people who haven't had the same experiences as me know what I learned from my own experiences. So three things I would do if I were uh, you know, starting a class on X, Y, Z, or whatever it is, you can start to create your own, your own content. And that's important, because again, think of that as like sitting in the job interview and somebody asking you a question and how would you respond? So if I said, you know, tell me two classes you took and why they were so important to you, what did you get out of them? That's not atypical on an interview. 
to say, and you know, why is that? Or what are the what are uh, two or three key things you're looking for from a company, and why you think you'd be a good fit for us? So, like the hire me HubSpot guy, he went through and he said five reasons why I would be a good fit for HubSpot and why HubSpot's a good fit for me. So the creating again doesn't have to be you putting yourself on a pedestal and saying that you're you know super smart and you know all that, which we all know we are. We just don't have to brag about it, right? But the idea is the the creation part is what was what you're doing there. One of my favorite things to do is to just say, hey, if you're interested in the in the area of digital marketing, here are three podcasts I'd highly recommend you listen to. And here's why. How many digital marketing podcasts are there? Tens of thousands. What am I doing that's helpful? I'm consolidating for my audience to say what three I would choose to listen to if I could only pick three. I'm not saying they're the perfect three. I'm saying they're the three I would pick and why. Does that make sense? What that does too is that tells interviewers, HR departments, how you're continuing to learn outside of the classroom, outside of the academic walls. Who are you keeping up with? And so when I've been able to name drop people like Chris Brogan, I've had people's eyes light up and say, you know Chris? I said, yeah, I know Chris. And, blah, blah. and it, it shouldn't change the dynamic, but it does. It's like when I name drop and I say that I work with Starb work, have worked with Starbucks, People work, look at me and treat me differently in the marketing world. Should they? No, because I'm the same person, but that gives credibility to say. So again, you can gain credibility by saying your favorite books, your favorite researchers, your favorite theories, your favorite whatever. Um, you know, again, sharing that knowledge out. And then five to 10% of the time you ask. And you can say, hey, I'm looking for a job. And I'm wondering if anybody has any recommendations on good, good companies that do XYZ, or I'm looking to do some informational interviews. Does anybody have any recommendations on people that I should uh, do an interview with? Or I'm looking for podcast, you know, you go and you ask. The problem is most people wait until they're ready to graduate and then they go asking for a job. So they flip this script and they look desperate. And if you think like the HR person, knowing the average person spends 13 months at their job, I don't want to hire somebody who's desperate. <laughs> I want to hire somebody who demonstrates that they have knowledge, passion, and want to be working at my, at my organization. Does it make sense? So again, I'm curating the majority of the time. So I just put together, uh, does anybody here use social media regularly for, for business use? I use a tool called Hootsuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. Hootsuite, and what you can do is you can do what's called social listening. So what I do, for example, is I, one of the big uh, hashtags in my industry is hashtag S-C-I-C-O-M-M, SCICOM. So I follow that hashtag, and I, ha I use Hootsuite to create an area where I can just see who is tweeting about SCICOM, and I can see, do I want to jump in that conversation and quick tweet stuff out? or you know, retweet somebody's stuff or interact with somebody. And every industry, I had, a, I had a chemistry student, a master's degree chemistry student being like, we don't use this stuff in our field. Well, she did a sh quick Twitter search the second day of class. She's like, oh my gosh, there's gazillions of people talking about chemistry on Twitter in this, in this area. Um, so, so the idea is using that social listening can help me find people who to curate and who to connect with. So finding relevant hashtags, you can do the same thing again on Instagram or other tools, but it's a really, really simple strategy to know what's going on. So following that hashtag to me is like going to a networking event where everybody's talking about science communication. It just happens that it's virtual and worldwide. So really, really, really simple thing to do. So that the content curation strategy, like I said, what you're gonna be doing is highlight what you think are the best things, give recommendations, and also give thank yous. Now this is a part that everybody like cringes because you have to do this in my class. And they hate it when they first learn that they have to do it, and then they do it and they see the results and they're like, hey, this is pretty cool. What I do is identify a couple of people who are thought leaders who have really influenced me. And does everybody have somebody that they can think of or some buddies they can think of who have been meaningful to them in terms of learning and building confidence, building skill? Yeah, okay. So if that person is online, which in my field they are, what do I do? Take a deep breath. I pull out this thing called a smartphone. 
I make it face towards me, and I don't take selfies, so it's, it's hard for me to do, and I hit record and I say, hey Chris, this is Brogan, this is Don Stanley, I know you don't know me from a hole in the wall, but I've been following your stuff the last three years, and it has really helped me understand how to do marketing and how to do marketing the right way and an ethical way, and I don't know if you hear it a lot, but I just wanna say thank you for what you do, I really, really appreciate it, and you're helping me out a lot. And I send that to them. Every time a student has done that, every single, and we're talking huge, huge names in their industries, every single time they've done that, what's happened? They've got a personal reply saying, thank you. Huge, huge names. I mean, million follower type people. Um, because who goes out of their way to say thank you? It's always, I want something from you, I want something from you, I want something from you. You go out of your way and you take the time and the courage to shoot a little video. Same thing after job interviews. You know, it sounds silly, instead of just a note, send a short little video to each person you met and say, hey, it was really great to meet you, I really appreciated what you talked to me about X, Y, and Z. Neuro neurobiologically, you're implanting yourself in their memory more as you do that. So you're gonna get remembered more. And you've taken the time and, and, and having the courage to do that, and again, it's a genuine thank you, but when you do that, it is amazing how many doors that has opened for me. Because people will be like, how did you get on international news? How did you get on national news talking about stuff? What I did was I followed reporters who covered fields and beats that I was interested in. And I would say, hey, I love the way you report. I love what you're covering. It's really great. By the way, you know, I'm, I teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I've been doing this for X, Y. If you ever need somebody quick to cover a story, let me know. I'm more than happy to jump on. Because I know reporters are under tight deadlines. So. Next thing you know, I'm getting calls to be on national, international, local, regional news. And then my, my kids will ask me, well, how did you get that? I'm like, don't you know who I am? Come on, come on. They're like, yeah, we know who you are. That's why we're asking. But, but that's, that, that was simply how I did it. Um, so anyway, really, really simple, but highly, highly undervalued. Um, then when it comes to creation strategies, these are the tips that I have people follow. Document your processes. So for example, how did you get to where you are? Document the classes you took. When I tell people that I was at a military academy with the goal of flying military aircraft and I got a major punch in the face and then had no idea what to do and I had to figure out what my next step was and then how did I end up in communications and marketing? I started realizing that the greatest change agents in the history of the world, which is what I wanted to be, were people who are great communicators. Think Martin Luther King, think Gandhi, think Buddha, Jesus, whoever you want to think. And so what I do when I tell that story is people are like, wow, that process is really interesting. You're documenting your journey of how you ended up here. And what that tells people is that the myth of the straight line, you know what you do and you just get there, is exactly that. What it is, is it's this. And people are like, oh, your journey took a lot of side steps. Good, mine is too. So how did you stay focused? How did you get there? You could document the process of you doing an experiment. You could document the process of you know, how to write a paper, whatever it is, whatever you think would be of value to your audience. Just share that process. It's almost like journaling in that sense. Share your perspectives. So for example, I have a PhD nuclear uh, engineering scientist in my class this semester. Her perspective on nuclear is very interesting and very cool because a lot of people's first reactions to hearing about nuclear are things like Fukushima and oh my gosh, what are the bad things? And what she's talking about is she's sharing her perspectives on how uh, nuclear can be used for large scale climate change mitigation. CO2 emission mitigation. And so is she the only, per, you know, only person to know anything about it? And is she 100% right? No, but she's sharing her perspective. And again, that's where you could share perspectives on books to read, podcasts to listen to, TV shows to watch. So for example, when I talk about science communication, I'm like, watch Marvel, cartoon, watch Marvel um, uh, movies. And I didn't get into Marvel movies until I had kids. I have three daughters, and my daughters actually got me into it. But there's a lot about science and the potential dangers of science and nanotechnology and all these types of things in those movies where people can learn. So I'll share my perspectives about how science is framed in those movies. And you know, so it can be mainstream stuff. Um, share your experiences. So if you've had things outside of um, you know your your profession, your profession, your work profession, for example. The number one thing that got me a job at the university, got me a job teaching, was I used to work as a dog trainer. And people will always laugh. They'll say, you know, a dog train, what? 
And I'll explain to them and I'll share that experience and it'll help them understand how I, under, I started learning about teaching and communications through working as dog training. So sometimes, th and by the way, anybody ever hear of Getty Images? Getty Images was my first big client. And one of the reasons I got that gig was the woman who I was working for as a dog trainer had a show on national public uh, radio as well as on um, the Discovery Channel. And I saw that the uh, CEO had a picture of a dog in his office. I said, oh, that's cool. He got a dog. Oh, yeah, you know about dogs. Oh, yeah, I work with Trish McConnell and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly the whole conversation changed. He's like, oh, and we ended up talking dogs for like 10 minutes. And he's like, it's going to be so fun to work with you. I'm like, yes. So I owed all of the dogs. Um, answer questions your core audience has. So like in the example I gave you, hire me HubSpot, the core question was, why should we hire you? But also, what are some things that students are learning in school now that you can bring to the table that can energize a workplace? Or I don't know what it is. This is where you have to think about who it is that you're targeting for employment and what questions that they would have. Summar summarize and curate the best of. So you know, this is where. I'll a lot of times create the, if I were to only be able to listen to three podcasts or read three articles or follow three people, and I'm randomly picking the number three, it could be more than that. But sharing out what you think is the most valuable. And then the last but not least is as you start to build your profile, you can start to say, hey, I'd love to do an interview with you. Would you be willing to come on and do an interview of what it's like to work at NASA? Because I'm applying for a job at NASA. And what's a day in the life like working in NASA? communications or whatever it is. And as you build your profile, if you start to build your profile, you'll get more and more people at different companies and organizations saying yes to you. And that's how you start to get on their radar. So they'll say, yeah, Don, just so you know, we haven't posted this job publicly, but we're going to be hiring for this. So if you want to send me some information, because uh, people prefer at HR units to, to hire internally versus trying to hire publicly. It's much more of a painful process to try to hire publicly. Um, you know, obviously at academic institutions or state organizations, you need to do that. But in terms of looking to, for ways to build a network, being able to ask people to interview with them. And then as you build uh, that social capital and ask for interviews, you can start asking for help. Hey, I'm looking for this position. And instead of putting out a tweet saying, hey, I'm looking for a job, I can reach out to certain people at certain companies, direct message them on LinkedIn or whatever the network is. And I can ask them for insights. Hey, I'm getting ready to interview for this job. So one quick example, uh, one of my former students who just completed his MD was studying uh, neuroscience here at the UW as an undergrad. He wanted to get a grant that was almost, ex undergrads could apply for it, but it was almost exclusively always given to graduate students. And he started building his profile and started connecting with some of the top neuroscientists in the world on Twitter. And a lot of the people, are, I've seen this a lot, where people, if they know you're a student and you're eager, eager to learn, they'll connect with you. They know that you're not trying to sell them, you're just trying to learn. So anyway, this gentleman, Kevin King, went and started making these connections and made connections with three of the top neuroscientists in the world. And he tweeted out, I'm applying for this grant. And I don't remember if an undergrad had ever won it or, or not before, but it had been very, you know, almost, again, exclusively graduate. I'm applying for this grant, and it's in this, in this area of neurosciences, and I have no idea what to do. I've never applied for a grant before. Can anybody help me out? He had literally had three of the top neuroscientists in the world tweet him back and say, oh, yeah, we'll walk you through the process. Let's jump on a Skype call, and, and we'll be a reference for you as well. So it can be pretty impactful and pretty powerful as you start to do those interviews and make those connections, which is what he did. That led to him being able to ask for help and then having those people respond. And yes, he did get the grant. So and then last, as, as we move into the final parts, we start looking at um, the type of content you can, tech, you can create. Again, text, audio, or video, whatever it is that, you, that you, is easiest for you. So here is what I do. I'm going to give you guys my super secret insider formula. This is being recorded, so we'll have to blow up the, the recording afterwards. So what I do is I, on my laptop, and I can show you every, my setup uh, when, we, when we finish, if anybody wants to see, I have an inexpensive microphone. I have an inexpensive camera. And what I do is I sit down and I think of what I want to talk about, create some bullet points, and then I shoot a video. Hey, Don Stanley here, and I'm going to talk today about 
why graduate students should be developing personal brands. What are the three reasons you should be doing it and three reasons on uh, three ways to actually do it. So I record the video. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a terrible writer. So what I do is I know that blog posts and the written word is, is important. I take that video and I send it to a company called TEMI, Temi, TEMI. And what they do is they take my video and for 10 cents a minute, they will transcribe that video. 10 cents a minute. And they turn it around usually in no more than four hours. So now the audio from my video, excuse me, the, the text from my video is now available. So I can put out a video, but I can also put out written text. Now I have to go through and I have to edit some of the language and make it a little bit cleaner, get rid of the ums and that kind of stuff. But I am able to create text content by simply doing, doing that process. You can also do it where you talk it into your phone and talk it in a speech to text tool. So if you're not good at writing, if you don't feel confident in your writing, that's a super simple trick to do. What I end up doing then is I take that video and then I will upload that video to YouTube. I will upload that video to Facebook. I will upload that video to LinkedIn so I could have it on multiple platforms so that depending on where people prefer to see the content, they can go and they can find it. But again, I can get the text transcript out of that. So my, my final formulas in terms of what to do is first, I recommend putting together a website. Now you can put together a website. You're going to share what you're, what you're learning, what you're getting, uh, what you're knowing. You can use a, a website tool like Wix, or you can use a website tool like WordPress. Um, very inexpensive. Uh, to put, there's free versions, but for like $8 a month, you could have you know, www.donstanley.com or whatever it is. Um, so you can get your own domain name, create a very, very basic website, just so that when people do searches, Google will look for you know, your name and they'll look for places where you exist. And uh, if you have your own website, it tends to rank higher than, if, than other social networks. Um, anybody know why that is? Side quiz question. Google owns Google, but they don't own LinkedIn. They don't own Twitter. They don't own Instagram. So what they don't want to do is they don't want to highlight competitors' networks in a Google search. So if you have your own website or YouTube channel, because YouTube is owned by Google, you'll rank higher when somebody searches for your name and for your information. So again, WordPress or Wix, really inexpensive, really easy to set up. Uh, you can set up a free version if you want and then later upgrade to it. Um, if a free version would be something like donstanley.wix.com, and then there'd be a Wix logo on all of my pages. And again, for like eight bucks a month, I can get rid of that. Is it worth uh, you know, the $96 or whatever it is a year to have a little bit more of a professional presence? It's up to you to decide. I think it is. Um, shows that you're just taking a and just looks a little nicer. It's like buying a little bit nicer clothes to go in for the interview. Um, Twitter, when it comes to Twitter, as I mentioned, this is the network that I, that I start everyone on and it's okay to spend time doing research on this. So if you get a chance, go to search.twitter.com. If you go to search.twitter.com, you can find all kinds of ways to, to target and identify people talking about topics hashtags, things that are relevant to you. And that's where you just start putting together your list of people you might want to target. That gives you an opportunity to identify people you can help, people you can retweet, people you can share from. Uh, and and it, this doesn't need to be 90 hours a week either. So tweet out great content that you find and give credit to others. Uh, sometimes I've gotten you know, yelled at for that. Why don't you just say you did it? And it's like, because I didn't do it. I want to give shine the light on the people who originated the idea if I can. Um, spending time finding great influencers, like I said, with the search.twitter.com. Twitter videos is a great way to give, give those little thank yous and start to get noticed. One of the things uh, we, I like to talk about in my classes is making content that's thumb worthy. So if, so if you think of how we use our phone, you scroll, 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 and you stop. Some thumb worthy content means people will stop and actually look at it. Get, we won't get into algorithms, but the idea is those uh, two networks like Twitter, like Facebook, like Instagram, uh, et cetera, know thumb worthy content and will promote it more, meaning that people look at it longer than they do other types of content. With LinkedIn, 
I would highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend setting up LinkedIn profile. One thing to remember about LinkedIn is that other pe people go on other social networks to kind of be entertained and to escape. They go on LinkedIn to get smarter and learn. So it's the one social network that people professionally don't get yelled at if they're on their computers when their bosses walk by, right? So this is, this is what, what, we, what you can do is go, again, just look at LinkedIn help and you can figure out how do you put together a good high quality profile. What are the elements of it? It gives you a quick check sheet of what to look for. Find people and groups in your industry and just start interacting with them. Start. Um, sharing content so like a lot of times what I do when I first walk into a walk into a, a new group or meet some new people is I share things that I think that would be useful to them or I tell them about people that they might want to be connected with hey hey uh, Dan I know I just met you but uh, there's this other person over here Cindy and Cindy's got some stuff that's related to your field you might want to check out and link up with her on LinkedIn so simple tactic to do LinkedIn, it's not LinkedIn Pulse anymore, but LinkedIn does have a platform where you can publish. If you didn't want to set up your own website with like a blog type uh, tool, you can go there and you can, uh, um, you can uh, publish there. And then when you reach out to make any new connections, make sure to include a personal message to that person as to why you're reaching out. How many people are active on LinkedIn in any way, shape or form? probably have all got those messages that, hey, I just want to connect. And then you connect with them and you get all kinds of messages you wish you weren't getting and then you, you know, disconnect with them. Um, so what you do, you know, way to stand out is to send those personal messages. YouTube, I love YouTube. Um, one of the reasons that I, I love the video component, again, is, and you don't have to do all of these, but if I'm shooting video, I can save it to my machine and upload it to YouTube as well as to other platforms. When people go to YouTube, what are they looking for? Looking for video content, right? Simple, simple, easy way to um, you know, establish a presence. Again, thinking of the Oprah effect. So huge opportunity. They, they, they say this year, 80 to 90% of all content consumed online is video content that includes you know, all types of um, platforms and everything. So video is huge. If you look at LinkedIn, LinkedIn is pushing video hard, meaning if you're producing video, your content is going to be seen more than people who are just uh, creating text. Um, and then, again, helpful tips and advice is, uh, as far as content strategy of what to do. Now, we covered a lot of, of ground here. And I want you guys to think about as we get ready to open up for questions, if you wanted to, is there anything that you heard today that you could start applying? Not all of it, but just if you could take one thing, is there one thing you learned that you could apply and start thinking about, I'm gonna use this to move forward. I have done this again with thousands of people, tons of students on campus uh, in my classes. I average between 40 and 80 students from all across campus in those classes. And I, there's no magic wand that makes it super easy and boom, you're done. It does take time, it does take effort, but I can tell you the people who put the time and energy into it have had tremendous, tremendous uh, opportunities that they've created for themselves. I literally every year get personalized messages from people who say, I took your class three years ago, it didn't, wasn't super clear in the class, I really tried, but it didn't work out, but now I see what I learned and it helped me start my own business or it helped me get hired here or it helped me. And to me, that's, I just love that. That's why I will never get out of teaching at the university level. I'll keep my business, but I won't get, because it's so cool to see young people get an opportunity to figure out what they want to do, learn about themselves, and then have opportunities to leverage that and, and feel good about what they do and you know, be profitable at what they do. So, so I'm happy to open it up to questions. If you guys have uh, any questions that you want to ask me, if I'm capable of answering, I will. If not, I'll send you to other resources, but do not hesitate. I always tell my students this. It's like, when you have somebody here who's done a lot of stuff, don't, now is a chance. And I used to be very introverted in class. And it's like, no, just have the courage to ask. Because if you do, I guarantee you other people in the room will have the same question. And if you don't ask now, I'm never going to answer. So even if you email me or call, no, I'm kidding.